Uh, so yeah, it's great to see everybody today uh, for a session, Digital Accessibility Essentials for, for Online Courses. Um, you will be muted uh, throughout the session, but please pop in any questions that you have in the chat. We have our colleagues here from the Academy uh, and from ADS who will be able to, to answer your questions. Um, also, there's several ways to adjust your view, I think, as you likely know, but with the, the screen sharing, pretty limited options. So. Uh, here we are, we're joined by Robert Uren from, you can go ahead, Chris, uh, from ADS, Chris Dobson, Instructional Multimedia Developer from the Academy, and Janet Woods, uh, Instructional Technologist. I'm Mike Bates, I'm Dean for Teaching and Learning and Distance Education, uh, and we're excited to share with you really some tips for getting started um, with accessibility, really some of the most common things that you will uh, likely encounter in your in your online courses and hopefully at some point in the future in your face-to-face -face courses. Go ahead, Chris. Um, so for this workshop, you, you can earn CEUs if you'd like afterwards by completing a personal action plan form. Uh, you have till December 11th, but might as well uh, get that done sooner than later. So we will also uh, paste this link in the chat for you and remind you as well at the end of the workshop so you can earn those CEUs. All right, so um, these are our objectives for, for this morning. And you know, as you know, Access and Disability Services does a great job providing accommodations for our students with disabilities. Uh, but in the online environment, it can be a lot harder to identify those situations where an accommodation is, is needed. So we hope today to really tell you some of the why behind uh, creating accessible course materials, certainly for students who, who report accommodations requests through, through ADS, but also for those who have disabilities that are, that are not reported. And you'll hear some statistics um, that give us just a sense of that scale potentially at Harper. But really all learners, even those without diagnosed disabilities, benefit from accessible course documents and course materials. Um, you know, readers, screen readers, for example, uh, students can engage with those to, to interact with course material uh, on a jog or on a run or a drive. And things like searchable transcripts for videos uh, are great study tools for, for students of, of all abilities. So we'll share with you some methods. Chris specifically will go through some methods for um, identifying some of those accessibility issues in your course particularly the most common ones with Word documents and PowerPoints, a um, little bit with PDFs, and how to remediate it. But we also don't want you to feel like you're totally alone with, uh, with doing this. And we also want to encourage you not to let perfection paralyze you with this work. Uh, there's a lot in terms of making course material accessible, and your course doesn't have to be perfect on day one. But I think it's really helpful to identify some of those most common issues that students may encounter so that when you do have an accommodation need, you can pivot. Um, if it's during the semester, we encourage you to work with ADS uh, around accommodations and, and remediation needs for your course materials. But if you're designing a new course, you can certainly work with the Academy. Uh, and we hope today really to show you some techniques for making and designing accessible course materials, but also to share with you supports for when you have a really huge remediation job so we can evaluate that request and possibly get some, some outside support for you. Um, the last thing I'll mention before I turn it over to Robert, you may have heard this morning Dr. Proctor um, talk about Blackboard Ally. This is a new tool that we've purchased at the college that integrates with Blackboard, and it will assess the accessibility of your course materials um, and, and really identify file by file where issues exist. And we'll also give you tips for remediating those materials to make them accessible. Um, it will also present file formats in alternative formats so students can access documents in multiple formats, um, which increases the accessibility. This program won't make your course instantly accessible. It's not a silver bullet, but along with some basic strategies and support from our areas, we hope that this will do a lot for our students at, at Harvard. Um, so we'll talk about the pilot in fall if you are interested in, in participating in that. So with that, I'll turn it over to Robert. Thank you, Mike. 
I actually was going to mention the same thing from Dr. Proctor today. It is a very exciting time here at Harper. I mean, if only a program could automatically remediate all documents, that would be the goal someday, of course. But for now, we all have that responsibility before we give that to a robot to do one day. I did want to start off by introducing myself. My name is Robert Uren. I am using American Sign Language, by the way, to communicate. There is an interpreter voicing for me currently. I work as a professional in disability services. I have been for several years now, including work at the Chicago Lighthouse with their deaf and blind program as a deaf blind technology trainer. That experience really has given me a good picture of how technology can be extremely helpful. You can use the iPhone, for example, without the screen. You could actually turn off the screen for an iPhone and it will still operate with voice and it will still respond to your voice with the screen being completely shut off. So that's a very cool, interesting fact. But the next three slides, I will be talking with you about current students at Harper. We will compare uh, with the national disability population, and we will be talking about how we can take this beyond a conference, our work here. So currently there are about 1200 students that are registered with disability services at Harper College. Now to register, students do have to make an appointment with us and disclose that they have a disability. Maybe you can imagine that uh, for some individuals, it's not exactly an easy thing to do. I would like to share of about the 1200 students that we have, half of those students have multiple disabilities. About a quarter of that number do rely on some form of digital accessibility. And that is from our office that includes electronic textbooks, documents to be read out by screen reader equipment. So when a student requests that our office has a reactive process of reaching out to faculty. And some of you have had this happen to you before, right? We reach out, we get your materials, make sure your videos are captioned, the documents are readable by screen readers, all of that. Now today you are empowering yourselves to make that change for your students and that will help to make this process not be reactionary. So if we're comparing the students with disabilities at Harper College, the 1200 um, students with disabilities that have federal funding, that office has suggested as of 2019, 20% of all undergraduate students have a disability. The top three disabilities are learning disabilities at 31%, people with ADHD, and psychiatric disabilities. So because of the laws that govern high school and college being different, students are expected to become their own self advocates the minutes that they enter into the college realm. High school, they are used to relying on their case manager doing everything for them, and that is a big change. Students suddenly are responsible and it does add a, a burden to them and they have to advocate for themselves and deal with any barriers that they encounter. Now here's the kicker. There is a research study, you can go ahead and advance to the next slide, Chris. 
So there was a research study that shows that 40% of students who used high school accommodations disclose their disability in college, which means 60% of students do not disclose. And that's for a variety of reasons. The most common reasons I see, they want to try college without accommodations because college is typically a time where you find your identity. It's a time of self growth development. So students want to try that on their own. I see that very frequently in my work and then they come to my office and disclose their second or third year after uh, they fail a semester or class or they experience too many barriers. There's also a stigma with disability. Now we are fortunate enough that the stigma has gotten better over time. People have become more aware of disability. Now with in-person classes, students can always share, have dialogues, connect with the instructors, learn from other students, figure out their learning style, all of that a lot easier. With this shift that we've had to the online world, I do want to add a quick tip. Charles Schwab, he is the head of investing. He's one of the largest investors in the country. He has a learning disability. I don't know if anyone's aware of that. He does rely, or he did rely on his mom and his family members to actually read for him. He relied on note takers in class. He relied on students to take notes for him. And this was back in the 70s. This was before the ADA was passed which initiated accommodations. This was back in the 70s. Accommodations were still very new at this time. So he said that he really had to work with others and that made him a people person. He had to learn how to interact with others very well because he couldn't do a lot of things for himself. Now with remote learning, that interaction is pretty much cut in half or even less than that. You have to rely on email, trying to interact with someone virtually. And we know since March, it's much different being online than it is being in person. I'm happy you all are here so you can take advantage of this opportunity to modify your course content proactively because that is key. You can go to the next slide, Chris. So proactively, what does that look like? What do I mean by that? Well, typically, I understand that faculty are the curators of their course content. You all decide what you want to have in your course and put together that content. So if accessibility could be considered from inception, well, let me back up and say accessibility has long been an afterthought. Now we're getting better with that. And for example, we have tools such as Microsoft Accessibility Checker that's able to check to see how accessible documents are. And Chris will be expanding on that a little bit later, but there's been a great change and a lot has happened. And especially with my, with the Blackboard Ally, we will have a lot more ability to make things accessible. Thank you for your time. Hey, Chris, we, we can't hear you, but it looks like you're not muted. So oh, I'm sorry. Um, there you go. Now yeah. You OK, um, thanks, Robert, for sharing some of those statistics with us and, and information. Um, and uh, so, yeah, we, we, we'd like to just share with you um, some uh, some of the uh, what we feel and others feel that are the essentials of um, 
authoring accessible content for your instruction. So uh, if we're, uh, the slide, we're going to uh, talk briefly about uh, presentation accessibility. Um, so if you're using um, Microsoft Office 365, which is available to all faculty and staff at Harper College, um, one of the things that you we want uh, you to be, you know, at least uh, check uh, for when you're starting to author a new presentation, or if you even have some older presentations, you might want to check uh, to see that if whether you were using slide designs uh, that are built into the slideshow, um, layouts and templates. Uh, and what I mean by that is, um, uh, usually when you add a new slide, you can choose from a slide design. Um, a lot of times, and this could be true for um, content um, from a publisher, um, but uh, if if you aren't you if it hasn't been used or if, you, if those layouts and designs haven't been used, there's a good possibility that some of your content uh, in a presentation may not be read by some someone using assistive technology like. Uh, screen readers and things like that. So uh, just drawing out a text box on your slide and typing text into it, um, that text would not be read by a screen reader. So um, we'll, we'll, we'll discuss a, a couple quick tests that you can do. Uh, but one of the things that, some of the things that you uh, may want to check um, with your power, PowerPoints or presentations um, is that all of your images have alternative text or alt text. Uh, this can be, you can in Office 365 run um, an accessibility check and text for alt text. Um, it, it'll, it'll run a check and it'll suggest uh, whether you have uh, need to add alt text to images. Um, also, you want to make sure you have uh, a unique uh, title for each slide. Um, so if you are covering the same content um, across multiple slides, you would want to use something like uh, one of four, two of four, three of four, four of four, or you could just put a, uh, if you got three slides, you could just put uh, slide one in parentheses or something like that, or, or the number one behind the title. Um, also, uh, you want to uh, check uh, to make sure that your reading order is uh, <clears throat> that your reading order is in proper order. So uh, by default, uh, you can check um, on the selection pane um, in, in your uh, PowerPoint. Um, it'll pull a sidebar down from the side and you can see that the see if that reading order is is pr being properly read. Now by default, uh, it's going to read from uh, the bottom up. Uh, because the first thing that's added to the slide is typically the uh, title. And uh, if you are using slide designs, you just kind of want to make sure that your content is going to be re read in the order that you want it to be. Um, so you can, in the, using the selection pane, move things up and down in that reading order. Um, also, uh, you want to make sure that you're using meaningful links. Uh, so to give you an example, just over here on this slide, uh, as opposed to just type or dropping in a URL, um, you know, it's, it's often helpful to uh, just highlight across the text and then add your hyperlink to that. Um, so um, the... Uh, the other thing um, you'll want to make sure to do is that uh, if you are using tables in your um, if you're using tables in your presentation, that those tables are using making use of column row and row headers, um, and you can also click on the table and make sure that it might it has um, check the table properties um, if the properties. Um, often allow you to add alt text or, or a summary to that table. Also, you, you're going to want to make sure that um, your color has enough contrast um, and that it's not the primary method of conveying meaning, uh, such as, uh, you know, um, writing out some text that's red, 
uh, yellow, green, uh, meaning, you know, green is, is go, um, yellow is warning or, or slow and, and red is stop. I mean, you want to make sure that they can convey the meaning of your content, not, not a, by color alone. Um, but just making sure that um, it has a high contrast as well, so it's easier to read um, is, is, is helpful. Um, I will demonstrate how to check uh, some of these files um, in just a minute after I cover some of this content. Um, if, again, if there's any questions, please feel free to drop those into the chat. Or, all right, uh, another thing uh, is making sure um, to, to check your PowerPoints. Um, if you, I know a lot of our faculty have just now started using Microsoft OneDrive or have moved a lot of their content from their uh, desktop computer up into OneDrive. Um, it, you can, to be able to check those PowerPoints, uh, basically you just go to, you open them up in Office 365, uh, select the review tab, and then you'll see, um, <clears throat> there's a check accessibility option. And what that does is when you click that, it will open up a sidebar in your, uh, next to your presentation, and it will uh, disclose any errors, warnings, or um, tips, or, or things that uh, you, you could check, uh, other things you could check. Um, so once you select that check accessibility, the sidebar will open. And uh, you will also be able to uh, click on the, the, if there are images missing alternative text, you can click on that image and it'll take you to that slide and that uh, image should be selected. Um, and when, once you do that, you click the format um, at the top and then you can uh, add alt text to that. Um, again, uh, these, if, these slides all have links out uh, to some of those um, how how tos or uh, how to um, some support materials for uh, these same um, presentation and uh, document accessibility and things like that. Um, so next, uh, talking about document accessibility, um, if you're authoring uh, text using uh, Microsoft Office 365 Online. Uh, some of these same things are important in, to make sure that your documents are accessible. So what you'll want to do, uh, you could, again, is open up a, a, a Word document um, and make sure that your document is making use of the default headings and styles. Um, you can highlight across that text and uh, you can select from the home menu you can add headings, uh, heading one, heading two, um, and and one way to check to see if your document is structured properly, it, you can open up uh, from the view tab, you can open up uh, the navigation pane and it will uh, show you um, your headings. That, that navigation pane can also be used uh, um, functionally by students or um, by people with disabilities um, to navigate uh, like a rather long document. Um, other things you want to make sure you're using properly are lists. Uh, you're not just typing in one dot, um, you know, uh, building the list properly with the list tool um, in uh, the application. Um, that way, uh, lists can also be read by screen readers. Uh, it'll say a list of four items, item one, or you know, and it'll actually read through uh, the item, and it it gives them um, more meaning to that, and they know that it's a list as opposed to just text. Again, meaningful text, or I'm sorry, meaningful links. You want to make sure that your documents have meaningful links. Um, and also, uh, you want to make sure that your Word documents have tables with uh, column and row headers. And again, the table properties, you can select a table, uh, go to the, the table tools up at the top of that document um, once you have a table selected, and just ensure that your 
uh, your first uh, row is a, a header row um, or a column if you're using both uh, content that's identifying the data. Also, just making sure tables are used for data only and not for laying out something on, on your document. Um, again, also, uh, you want to make sure that uh, your images have alt text or alternative text. Um, and again, that color is not used for uh, conveying meaning and that you have enough contrast uh, in your uh, documents. Okay, and then also, uh, if you're um, if you're you if you are a math or a science uh, teacher, you may want to consider using uh, or creating uh, content that's either written with MathML, uh, Math Type, or LaTeX. Um, this makes that accessible. Uh, makes those formulas and uh, the calculations uh, accessible to students that are using assistive technology. Um, there are some add-ons to PowerPoint. Um, I don't, I, you know, I don't, I'm not absolutely sure those are available for Office 365. There may be some add-ons, um, but you would want to uh, explore that or build those um, calculations out ahead of time and then upload uh, that, that content to your uh, Blackboard course or something like that. There is uh, uh, there is uh, uh, an equation editor built within Blackboard as well. Um, I've heard there are some limitations to that as well, but uh, just may, doing some of this will uh, ensure that some of your documents or most of your documents are accessible again to students with disabilities. And again, we'll, we have some resources linked up uh, for learning more about that. And if you have any questions, please reach out to us in the Academy or uh, Access and Disability Services. All right, uh, same thing. Uh, and I, again, I said I would demonstrate uh, a little bit of that uh, afterwards. Um, but again, evaluating, uh, say, a Word document in Office 365, again, you would just go to the Review tab and check accessibility. And then that does open the uh, sidebar next to your document. And uh, then you can, again, work through any of the uh, errors or warnings. Um, you can select on it. In, in some cases, it will also show you how to fix. Um, if you're using uh, uh, Microsoft Office 2016, um, the accessibility checker also um, may have more uh, information linked up below um, the sidebar, uh, where you, if you click on an error, it will show you how to fix uh, or why to fix, how to fix, um, and then sometimes will give you some resources that you can link out and learn more about uh, those kind of errors. Um, <clears throat> so uh, let's see. Next, uh, we we'll just uh, talk just a minute about um, PDF document accessibility. Um, so it's always best uh, if if um, if you don't have the original document uh, that the PDF was created for, it's always better to have the like the original electronic document um, if you need to repair accessibility. Um, but uh, if you cannot, there are some things that you can do uh, to check to see how accessible that document is. Um, so for example, uh, the, like a, a real simple way would be to see if you can select across the text of a PDF. Um, and uh, if it's only a, a scanned image or, or something, uh, what, usually what you need to do is use something like um, uh, Acrobat Pro or, or come to the Academy if you don't have Acrobat Pro and run an accessibility, uh, or, or I'm sorry, an OCR, which is an optical character recognition on that PDF uh, so that it is full text searchable. Um, there is also um, an, another quick check would be to go to the properties um, of that document and check to see if it's a tagged PDF. 
Um, again, you can also check like with Acrobat Reader, you can check, uh, you can go into um, the tools area uh, and you can turn on read out loud and activate the read out loud and see if the text would be read in a um, discernible or, or in the proper reading order. Um, so there are some things that you uh, would like if you're creating your own documents in Microsoft Word, um, you know, make sure to add um, things like uh, your uh, under the properties, you can add who the title is, the author, any keywords, um, making sure the language is identified as English ahead of time. Um, that way, when it's converted over as a PDF, though that, that metadata will come over with it. Um, this helps uh, students with uh, disabilities um, that they can better organize and search their, their files by keywords. Um, these kind of, uh, uh, these kind of settings and making sure some of this is done is be benefits all of us um, in, in, you know, for searching files on, uh, on your computer, uh, things like that. So there's some very simple things that you can do uh, with your electronic documents ahead of time uh, for, you know, if you are converting to a PDF file from either out of Word or, uh, you know, making a, a, a PDF um, or going back to repairing a PDF in Word and then creating a PDF from that. So, uh, again, uh, you can check, um, even I believe uh, Acrobat Reader, you can check accessibility um, and there, that will just identify that some of the problems that may be with that file. And again, if you don't have the full Acrobat uh, Pro, uh, please, you know, come and see us over in the Academy. Uh, we have it on some of our computers uh, once we're back to campus. If in the meantime, uh, you know, reach out to one of either the Academy or, or if you're having some issues. Um, the, uh, um, next, uh, we'd just like to talk a little bit about, uh, audio, um, accessibility. So, um, if you are creating your own audio, uh, say for like a podcast or something like that, um, it would, uh, you know, it'd be, we recommend that you provide transcripts for that audio, um, or podcast. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, uh, as I mentioned here, there's, there is no, not always a quick way for transcribing audio, uh, but there are some things that you can definitely do uh, to make that process easier. For example, working from a script when you are recording um, or, uh, you know, if you are trying to create uh, um, a, uh, a transcript, uh, you may want to consider while recording uh, using something like, uh, you know, like Google Trans Translate um, or Google uh, Voice Typing. You can open up a file while you're recording, maybe to the side. Um, you can turn on, like in Google Docs, you can uh, go to the Tools menu and you can turn on uh, Voice Typing. And it will, it does a pretty good job of uh, creating that while you would be voicing uh, obviously, you want to eliminate any background noise of any kind if you can. Um, but uh, you, there are some other online tools uh, that you could can make use of: Web Captioner, uh, OTranscribe, and uh, Web Captioner. These are two online uh, free online tools that you can use. Uh, you can put for OTranscribe. You can put your file up there and uh, create a. a a transcript. Um, web Captioner, same deal. You can uh, have Web Captioner open while you're recording your audio and it will uh, type out what you're saying um, and you can download that. The only problem with some of these tools, there are limitations to these auto transcription tools. Obviously, they're not time encoded. So um, you would probably have to go in and kind of format that text so that it's a little matches up better with what your the content that you're covering. Um, it will also not automatically, um, you know, um, 
like if you have some uh, noise or sound effects or things like that, um, it would you would want to uh, you know add um, some uh, audio uh, description of things other things that are happening in the background. Um, so if you um, are are you know if you are doing some uh, audio tracks or, or podcasts or things like that, please reach out to, again, to Access and Disability Services or the Academy, and maybe we can help you uh, kind of create a workflow um, for your, your production of any audio like this. Um, and again, we have some resources linked up that um, would describe some of these in further depth. Okay, videos. Uh, so I know um, um, I've worked with several faculty at Harper College that are creating their own uh, videos. Um, so again, uh, every faculty and staff have access to Microsoft Stream. Um, if you're doing your recordings in say something like uh, Blackboard Collaborate Ultra or WebEx, you can download those recordings and put them up to your own personal um, your, your own personal uh, Microsoft Stream account. Um, and uh, upon uploading that video, um, it does an auto uh, captioning. Um, and uh, again, it, it will not always do a perfect job. I think Microsoft Stream does a better auto captioning process than what um, even YouTube does. So um, the nice thing about Microsoft Stream is once you have your video up uploaded to Microsoft Stream, um, takes a little bit for the the transcript to be auto generated, but then you can select the um, there's a, a little pencil up in the corner. Um, you can edit that that uh, those captions or on the side here or subtitles, um, and it it. It, it works pretty well. Um, I, I've been able to, per, personally, I've been able to uh, caption video quicker with Microsoft Stream than I, I even am with uh, YouTube. Um, you can also repair your, your captions in YouTube as well. Um, but, um, but if you're using something like Blackboard Collaborate, um, you can download uh, the subtitles uh, and they come down as a web VTT file or web video extract file. And that can go directly back up to um, Blackboard Collaborate. You can up, pull the file down, upload it right back up to uh, Blackboard and those captions would be available for your Blackboard recording. Um, so, but if you, if you are hosting video on YouTube or something like that, um, you may have to convert uh, that VTT file or pulling it down from stream. Um, you may have to convert that to uh, YouTube's SBV file or um, it's a, a subrip or SRT file format. And you could do that using an online conversion to tool uh, called GoTranscript. Uh, if you do a search for Go Transcript, a, a subtitle converter, you can you can pull this the uh, captions down from uh, Microsoft Stream, use that conversion tool to switch over to SBV, and that'll go right back up to YouTube. Um, so, to me, uh, that that it it's a, a small little step, but once uh, you do that, um, it, it certainly makes uh, the captioning uh, re repairing and um, making sure your captioning uh, is more accurate um, for the students. Um, again, there are some limitations to uh, those auto captions. So you would wanna go up and and just go through um, your video if you can and repair, uh, repair those captions. Again, uh, if for an accommodation or something like that, please reach out to Access and Disability Services. Um, <clears throat> all right, so uh, I am done with uh, my part to cover. I think uh, in the interest of time, uh, I don't know, uh, we can move on if we have any time at the end. I can demonstrate uh, something if need be, 
or address any questions. Okay, thanks, Chris. All right, you can hear me okay? Yes. All right, perfect. Okay, hi everybody. I am Janet Woods, the instructional technologist here in the Academy. So to support Harper's commitment to a more inclusive campus, this fall we're excited to introduce a new, to a new tool called Ally that will help improve the accessibility of your course content in Blackboard. So improving the accessibility of your course content will not only help ensure students with disabilities can access your materials, it will also improve the learning experience for all, including students who use mobile devices as well as those who want to engage with the material in a different way. So go ahead and advance the slide, Chris. Chris, next slide. Yeah, it's, it's, oh, it's just lagging. running slow <laughs> for some reason. That's okay. Try. Did there I go too far? Okay, that works. All right, thank okay. you. Okay, so here's how Ally works in Blackboard. As content is uploaded into your Blackboard course or content that already exists in your Blackboard course, you'll notice red, orange, light green, and dark green gauges next to your course files. These are called Ally indicators, and they let you know the accessibility of the file. For additional information about the file, you just go ahead and click the indicator. Okay, next slide, please. And here it goes. We could sing in between transitions, right? I know, right? <laughs> you don't want to hear that. Um, okay, so clicking the indicator provides detailed feedback about what the accessibility issues are with the file. So Ally doesn't just list the issues, it also includes an explanation of why these issues matter and guidance as how to fix the issues. So one thing to note is are the indicators are only visible to instructors in the course. Students will not see these indicators next to the files. Next slide, please. Oh, that one was quick, okay. So here's what students will see. With Ally enabled in your course, students will be able to download an alternative format of a file by clicking the drop down icon next to the file name and then a box will pop up you could see the box what it looks like on the right that will let them choose a version of the file that's most appropriate for their device and their need so this alternative format option for students is available as soon as ally is turned on for your course which means that while faculty members are in the process of improving their course files, students are still able to access and download a copy of the alternative file format. And as a faculty member though, know that the more accessible your original course files are, the better these automatically generated formats will be for students. So next slide. Okay, so as an instructor, you will see the Ally accessibility indicators in your course and you're gonna wanna start fixing your content, but it can seem really overwhelming. So where do you start? That's where the course accessibility report comes into play. So the accessibility report is easily accessed under the course tool section of your course when Ally is turned on. And then this is a real-time report that provides the accessibility summary and overview at the course level. So Allies Accessibility Court displays, report displays three things. So number one, it displays the accessibility score for the entire course. Number two, all content in your course grouped by content type. And then number three, it provides a list of all remaining issues identified in the course in order of in order of priority from severe to minor. Next slide, please. So it's recommended to use the report to help you decide what to fix first. So for example, you can start with content that is the easiest to fix or that will have the biggest impact on your overall score. Or maybe you'd rather focus on specific issues or tackle the most severe issues first. Or you could decide to start with the fixing of the specific file types, such as all images or PDF documents. 
So the approach you take is definitely up to you and using the accessibility report, it's an important feature of Ally that will give you the guidance needed to make your course files more accessible for all students. Next slide. Okay, so currently Ally checks files in these formats on the accessibility report. This includes PDF files, Office files, uploaded HTML files, image files, WYSIWYG content, which is content that you type directly into Blackboard. So note there are no indicators that show up for WYSIWYG content when you look at your Blackboard course, and those results will only show up in the course report. So Ally will also check YouTube videos for captions, and auto-generated YouTube captions are not considered to be valid captions, so they will not be included. I know there was a lot of discussion going on in the chat about the auto-captions. Um, but Ally checks for both embedded, checks both embedded YouTube videos and links to YouTube videos in Blackboard courses. But something to keep in mind at this time, Ally only presents the information about the YouTube videos and the institutional level reports. So if you look at your course report, your YouTube videos won't necessarily get flagged at this time. Okay, so go ahead next. Next slide, please. Okay, so Ally provides alternative formats for these file types for the students to download. So for instance, if you have a Word document in your course, students will be able to click the Ally icon that's next to the file and download that Word file as one of any one of these alternative formats that are shown on the right of the slide. So since Ally is a tool supported by the college, the students would also be able to get assistance from the help desk if they have questions about downloading the alternative formats of Ally. Next slide. Okay, so in summary, here are some reasons why you should think about trying Ally and how it benefits both students and faculty. So the Ally tool and report can assist faculty in building high quality accessible content and correcting files that are already in your Blackboard course. Using Ally is a way to respond to the student needs for accessible versions of content. And while faculty are in the process of improving their files, students can still access the alternative formats of those files and download them. And using Ally to improve your course content builds the institutional capacity to respond to the increasing federal and legal requirements for accessibility. And finally, remember accessible content is better content for all. So at this point, I'm gonna turn the microphone over to Mike Bates, who's going to talk about an opportunity for faculty to get started with Ally this fall. So we are really excited to to purchase Ally, and when we worked with Blackboard over the summer on implementation, they really advised us strongly to roll out some kind of pilot before launching this at scale, uh, in part to raise awareness among, the, among faculty and students, but also so that we could learn how best to support faculty and students through, through a pilot. Um, so that's, that's our goal for the fall, and the way we're doing this is with, um, with a workshop that we're going to repeat two times in uh, September 24th and October 2nd. So we'll come, we'll show you more detail about how to use Ally, we'll help you to identify um, some of the accessibility issues that may exist in your course. Uh, and then over the course of the semester, we'll kind of work with you in a consultation process to uh, remediate content, and you can sort of get to see that higher and higher score in Ally, um, and you'll get a digital badge, which is kind of a new thing for us in the academy that you can um, you can boast and say that you've got a uh, fully accessible or close to fully accessible online course. So we invite you to participate in one of those workshops, and there's a link here in the chat um, with how to register. One last thing I'll share before we go to the next slide, um, I had a conversation with, with Jason Altman from ADS that really opened my eyes over the summer. Um, you know, to me, I, we have been so focused a lot on captioning in the academy and providing that kind of support, and we think that's still really important. Um, we caption all our videos and things like that when we put them up on the website. But he helped me really understand the nature of the students at Harper College, the disabilities that they, that they have. 
Um, and yeah, captioning is important, but really he talked about the impact of document accessibility um, and really helped me understand like the, the impact this can have really at a, a wide scale for Harper College students, more so than I initially thought. Um, it's more than just students who may be blind. It really is a, a wide range of, of abilities um, that would benefit from document remediation. So that makes me feel like this ally purchase is, is transformative for the college. Uh, and I'm really excited for, for this pilot. Okay, Chris, uh, next slide. I think we are just about wrapped up. Uh, just a reminder to submit the personal action plan uh, should just take a few minutes for CEUs and you can indicate on this form if you're interested in the fall pilot. Um, we'll send you some information, but you can also again register for that workshop and pilot on the, the most recent link here that Amanda posted in the chat. So we would welcome questions that you have. Go ahead and type them in the chat. And Chris, if um, I don't know if the questions don't roll in, do you want to maybe bounce out and do any any demonstration or I see a head shake, maybe not <laughs> up, up to you. So uh, uh, I would be questions. happy to. Oh, we have a question. Absolutely. From, uh, before that, we have a question from Nellie. Um, if tests that are written and administered in Blackboard are accessible with screen readers? It's a great question. So um, <clears throat> I guess uh, depending on how those tests were created, right? Um, if uh, uh, so, uh, Karen has works with a lot of faculty building their tests. Um, there, um, there are some tools out there called uh, like a Blackboard test generator. Uh, typically, you have to kind of strip out any images um from that uh and put it up as it'll generate a text file that can be loaded up into blackboard as a pool um which you can create your tests from the only problem is is that if you to have images or something like that you are uh it, it's recommended uh highly recommended that you also add the alt text back in for that image um so um uh, obviously, like I was working with uh, one faculty on some of their OER content that they were creating. Um, we had to take out, they, f they found a resource, they were taking, they were adopting uh, content for OER. We had to take out all of the images um, from that, te those tests, and then um, upload that the pool, um, create the test, and then put the images back up there. Now, in that case, I, I couldn't be, uh, uh, you know, I could only help so far with some of that content because um, obviously it takes the subject matter expert or uh, to go in there and, and uh, make sense of those images. So uh, just keep in mind, um, definitely can be done accessible. It's just, it does sometimes take a little bit of um, rework of, uh, content like that that's maybe visual. Any other questions um, in the chat? Um, let me, me I'll stop sharing my screen here for a minute. We did um, have something come up early, Chris, that sure. I'm not sure we could answer. So sometimes when you're describing how the screen readers read the documents, I know it's different whether you're in Word or in PowerPoint. And sometimes you mentioned that in some cases it goes from the bottom up. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Uh, sure. Let me, uh, I may have to jump back into screen sharing. Um, but uh, yeah, so uh, it, it, it does seem kind of counterintuitive. Um, the, uh, in um, let me, I'm going to jump back into screen sharing here for a minute. Um, hopefully it'll, there we go. All right, I'm going to exit presentation mode here. All right, and then uh, I'm, this is Office uh, 365. Um, so I'm just going to go back over to, um, I don't know if I'm in presentation mode any longer or not. Let's see here. You're not. We're seeing we're seeing the preview uh, screen, Chris. Okay. Okay. I just want to make sure it's it's 
is I'm still getting some the slide uh, some of the slide tools down at the bottom to advance the slides. So let me um, let me do this. Let me exit out. Try. Let me do a little bit of a. Maybe I can jump between my tabs. Hmm. Yeah, it's kind of like freezing up for me. Okay, there's there's my uh, PDF file. <laughs> um, let me try to get back over to the presentation. Okay, it's going to take me just a minute. There we go. Okay. So um, in, in Office 365 on the home tab, uh, or yeah, the home tab or home ribbon, you can go over to arrange and you can go down to selection pane and it will open up uh, on the sidebar. Uh, it will tell you uh, what, how that's being read. So the idea is, is that uh, since PowerPoint, um, if you're using the slide designs uh, or, or these are the slide layouts. Uh, so for example, here we have uh, the different slide layouts that are associated with this uh, presentation. Um, you can add to those. Uh, you cannot do it in Office 365, but you can create your own slide designs in the desktop version of PowerPoint. Um, but using what they call placeholders, you can, they have placeholders for text, they have placeholders for video uh, or, or all content where you see the little icons and you can add, add files um, that way. Uh, but you want to make sure you're using these uh, slide designs or layouts because um, what happens is um, you, you might, you could have uh, multiple content here on your slide but um, you want to make sure that they're being read in the order that you want them to. So in this case, um, it's reading, it's going to read the title first, then it's going to read the right content on the right first, and then the content on the left. So in order to improve or fix that, I could just click that text box and I can bump it uh, up. And then now it should read the title first the text uh, on the left first, and then the text on the right. And so it's it, you can repair the reading order um, by using the selection pane so that it's read in the order that you want it to be. Um, so, so you, a lot of, that's usually a manual check. Um, it can't, uh, you know, it does, it, it's not gonna infer uh, your, your um, content for you, but if you're using the slide designs, that should, um, you can fix that ahead of time uh, with your master slides if you want to. Um, I hope that answers the question. Um, there's uh, the other th thing while I'm right here, you can also, if you go to the review tab, you can, in PowerPoint, you can check the accessibility. Let me close down the selection pane. And, uh, you can go through uh, to see like what slides uh, might have uh, content that's missing alternative text. So um, in this case, uh, there there is an image here that's missing um, missing alt text, um, and then it also says here's one that's missing uh, a a slide title. I don't know. It looks like a slide title to me, right? Um, I don't know. I, I think, uh, again, it, it might have been, uh, I think this was a last minute ad, right, Mike? Uh, right. So uh, this is really good um, because that's basically a text box. That, and if you slide that text box around, you'll see right. you'll see something under it. Oh, yeah. Oh, look at that. So it got <laughs> us. <laughs> uh, that's good to, good to demonstrate. Uh, yeah. I appreciate you helping me with that. <laughs> sure. Absolutely. Happy to show um, my, my own flaws there. No, no, that's all right. Um, also, you can see here uh, it's rec it, it it's telling you there's a warning, some hard to read uh, text contrast. 
Um, so you can click that. It, it might give you, um, so like I said, uh, down below, um, there is uh, links out to how to, you know, learn more about how making your documents accessible. Um, but, you know, in, in the desktop version, um, it will actually, uh, when you run the accessibility check, um, it, you can select on the error and it will some, it will give you how to, fi how to fix, why to fix um, content there as well. Um, and then, uh, you know, I was, uh, if I was jump real quick over to, I know uh, we're right at 12 o'clock, um, but uh, same thing with Microsoft Word Online. Uh, if you were wanting to check that, you go to the review tab, uh, run, do a run and check accessibility. Um, in this case, it's not picking up anything, which I'm not real sure why. Uh, but uh, if you go to the view tab, you can turn on the navigation pane. And um, if you start to structure your document, um, you can go over to the home tab and just start add, making the content. Um, accessible uh, or at least structured right so um, in this case as you are building that you will see like an outline mode uh, created um, from from the uh, inside the navigation pane um, in this case uh, so we if we keep building this out um, a spaniel is a is a dog so in this case I'd probably want this to be um, a heading four. Whoops, sorry about that. Um, if I drop the style menu down. Um, I we can make that a, a four heading four. Uh, again, heading. Uh, this would be a, a field is a, a certain kind of spaniel. So what you're wanting to do is you're wanting to make sure that your headings are properly nested for structure. Um, so in this case, I'd want the field spaniel to be underneath spaniel underneath dog and making sure that structure is um, proper um, again uh, i'm going to close the accessibility checker um, if you uh, add alt text uh, you want to select the image go up to picture and select on alt text and then um, you know put in uh, some kind of a um, alternative description of that uh, of that image. Um, I'm just gonna put uh, field spaniel at dog show or something like that. Um, and keep it simple. It, it will sometimes auto generate a, a description uh, for you. So it, again, this is kind of a manual check. Uh, a lot of times that's how publishers get by um, some of these accessibility reviews uh, because all their images just have file names on them and it, it doesn't describe at all what that image is um, so it is important to maybe uh, take a look at some of your publisher content if you're using publisher content um, look it over uh, see it, you know uh, they're getting better about it but uh, every every vendor will tell you they're 508 compatible and sometimes that I don't think they even know um, what that means uh, the other quick real quick update uh, or real quick demonstration was um, in Microsoft Stream, if you go, again, if you go up to your waffle, um, if you don't see Microsoft Stream in this app list, uh, you can go over to all apps and find Microsoft Stream. Uh, you can uh, upload uh, content. Um, you, can, you can also record your screen in Microsoft Stream. Um, and uh, once you have a video loaded, um, you can go in there, you can put in details, description, the language. Um, but over here on the side, uh, you, once those auto captions are created for your video, you can download that those captions as a web VTT file or a web video text track file. And um, you can also upload a, a subtitle file. Um, so uh, sort of back and forth, but uh, the um i'm going to cancel this um if i was to go to one of my uh videos um hopefully this one will come up um the nice thing about it is you can um you can actually edit this once those auto uh, captions are made 
um, and to uh, fix any content, you just click this uh, uh, pencil up here at the corner and then you can uh, work through and fix those captions and the timing. So Chris, once that's done, uh, since we can't share directly from stream with, with students, what would, what would you recommend so that we could share that with students? Well, so uh, it can be, um, let me, I can also pull up, uh, this is what it, it generates is a, uh, the web VTT file. It's not, I mean, it basically does a time encoding um, and uh, you can create a transcript from that uh, possibly. Um, you may have to, uh, again, there may be some formatting involved, um, but if you were to put the same VTT file or, or you have to convert it if you're going up to YouTube, um, but once you got that, uh, um, once you loaded those VTT file, uh, you have to convert it to SBV or, or SRT subrip, uh, put it back up to YouTube, and then you're going to have an interactive transcript in YouTube as well. So um, in order for sharing, uh, you know, yeah, I mean, you again, the VTT file can go right back up into Blackboard Collaborate to prov for providing captions uh, for your Collaborate recordings. Um, but if you're going to use this to create a, a, a transcript, um, you would have to, you know, obviously you would want to strip out some of the content to, to make sure it's a readable uh, transcript. Um, but the time encoding is there. You just have you would just have to kind of uh, rework it a little bit um, or take some of that content out. Um, anything else? I think we're good. So yeah. we we have recorded this, and once we get this video captioned, we will make it available through uh, the academy website, so you can access any of this information. And if you want uh, more help with any related content, just submit an online instruction support form and someone from the Academy and or ADS will be in touch with you to, to help out. So uh, thanks for coming. Thanks for being a part of it. Hope you all have a great start of the semester and we will talk with you soon. Did we cover all the questions? I think we did. Good. I think we got them all. All right, cool. bye everyone.